And welcome to the Writer's Life, a place where you get to sight, sound, smells, taste of my particular writer's life, where you get the truth about the writer's life, my, my truth anyway, which could be a little dubious. Um, subscribe if you haven't already, punch the like button, and uh, tap the bell for notifications so you don't miss out on one single exciting video. And by all means, go to www.vinzandry to grab a free thriller. It's actually Moonlight Fall, so you get like a real book, a big book. Grab it for free um, if you want. And, um, or grab some of the new thrillers I got, I got coming out. I got American Crime Story, book th three should be out next week. If I can finish the read through of the fucking thing. Yeah, like something is always getting in the way. But uh, hopefully next week. All right, I have Frank Theodat on with me today. Frank um, is from South a or Southeast Attleboro, Massachusetts, which I could practically throw a football there, which okay. is a big, well, it's a big fat lie, but I almost feel like I could. But I, if, if I look out my window right here, I see Vermont on one hand, I see Mass, well, directly I see Mass the Blue Hills of Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you can also sort of see from mine, I guess. I don't know. So I said, but anyway, um, so Frank and I share the same weather patterns. And we also share the same love of pulp fiction. And we're both pulp fiction writers. We write our asses off. Um, and Frank also has a new sub stack. Um, I know I'm going to screw it up. It's three Ps. Uh, pipe, pulp, <laughs> and poetry. Close. You're, you're, you're poetry. Nearly there. Pulp, pipe, and poetry. I'm pulp, so pipe, and poetry. I should I should have assumed it was pulp first, right? Yeah. I mean, if you want a quick like little story of how that all came together, we took probably forty eight hours to. It was it's me and four other guys, and uh, we've never met online. We've only met on Discord, uh, mostly for the same thing, like same uh, understanding of the pulp ethos, or as I call it, the pulp work ethic, and. Right. You know, I had come up with the idea of doing our own magazine. I didn't know how, but I said, well, wouldn't that be cool to kind of do it with, you know, with all five budding pulp writers or, you know, as aspiring pulp writers. And enough of them just said yes. And within 48 hours, we got a logo. Uh, we got, you know, a name together for Substack. We got everything, you know, squared away. And we launched, and within 30 days, we had roughly like two, 300 subscribers. And wow. the momentum of everybody just saying yes for this this new, exciting thing. You know, right. a, little, a little of the excitement's kind of, uh, you know, settled in as with everything goes on. But I think... Things normalize. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people uh, really dig what we're doing. I think a lot of people respect, you know... Uh, I mean, you, you of all people know how traditional publishing has been and how a lot of that has just kind of uh, had the effect on, you know, readers today. So I think people, you know, today are really kind of looking for something new, something that they can be a part of. Um, I guess you could call it a movement in, in, that, in that sense. But Pulp Pipe and Poetry, you know, we're the variety magazine uh, for fiction. So we do fiction uh, Mondays and Fridays. Fridays are for paid readers. And then Wednesdays, we do a variety piece. So we'll do tobacco reviews. We'll do uh, music playlists. We'll do uh, poetry. We'll do uh, film reviews. We'll do all sorts of cool stuff uh, on there. And people seem to really, really, you know, like what we're doing. And we got a lot of support, which is pretty cool. Imagine, I mean, just even 10 years ago, you you come up with an idea for a magazine like this, a really cool magazine that caught my attention, and you're able to put it together basically in a few days and have it up and running. You're up and running within a few days, and you have three or 400 subscribers by the end of the month, and you're just growing and expanding. Imagine that, you know, that's the beauty of being alive today and working in this business you can just do whatever you want how you want um for as long as you want um it's just your baby and nobody else is going to tell you different 
Um, and that's, I, I, I fucking love that. You know, it just dawned on me. I think the first time I ever, correct me if I'm wrong, and then you get tons of comments, you know, but I think you were doing a music thing. And this might have been the first time I like you caught my eye and it was like, uh, maybe it was you, maybe it was, it wasn't, but it was like, uh, noir music, you know, music that, that lends itself to, to literary noir. And, and I, I happened to chime in about the chameleons. The soul you, yeah, you that, so the, the, um, the guy who does our, one of the partners, one of the P3 partners, I call him P3 for short, will it catch on? I don't know. Um, yeah. What, what, three, what, that's right. yeah, exactly. It's, it's just easier to remember. But <clears throat> one of my partners, uh, Brady Putsky, is the one who puts the yes, playlist. Brady. Yes, Brady puts the playlist. That's who was. Yeah, Brady is uh, uh, trained in music. So he's got, you know, he's a multi talented Renaissance man. And I think you should have him on your show sometime in the future because he's also a budding uh, uh, pulp writer as, at, at heart as well. Um, but he puts the the plays together, and a lot of people really enjoy them. And I think, um, you know, there's a little bit of something for everybody. You know, poetry does very well. Uh, James Shrimpton does uh, poetry for us. Uh, Zach Grafman does a lot of the tobacco reviews. Frank Kidd has done a lot of the film reviews for us. So there's a little bit of variety for a lot of people there. Um, and I think, you know, what... I hope, hopefully, you know, want to do within the next five years, hopefully sooner, is really branch out offline and really do something in the publishing space. I wrote a uh, an editorial a couple of weeks ago, maybe last month, on you know the state of fiction for boys and how. I keep hearing from people saying, "Oh, well, boys aren't interested in reading," and there's a there's some uh, research from Deloitte that had published out that girls are just reading more than boys, and boys just are not. You know, they're it's 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 just minimizing over the over the years. Right. And my philosophy, my personal opinion, has always been: I think the boys who are not reading aren't finding interesting things to read. That's my that's my whole you know philosophy on that. And I think if you cater to uh, what their interests are, if you cater to what they enjoy, if you cater to, you know, basically their what how how it is for for them. You know, you you think about like the Hardy Boys. You think right. about you know all the all the all the fiction that came in. You think about Horatio Alger. You think of um, uh, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson for Treasure Island. You think of all these these you know pivotal stories. And uh, Zach Grafman, one of our partners, is actually going to put together. Um, an essay on uh, uh, boys fiction, just like the, the the biggest authors that really you know influenced him wanting to write, wanting to write fiction. And I think right. so many people in an independent movement were so focused on you know whether it be comic books or novels or short stories, or whatever for all that other stuff. But there's a whole generation out there that is not as exposed to like this independent movement this for independent publishing. So that's what I really would eventually like to do is kind of create a, a separate unit that's dedicated uh, for uh, boys fiction and, and take it off for that way. That sounds really exciting because I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think if, if, first of all, they've been saying for years and years that boys don't like to read. And uh, that's because you're just not, giving them what they want to read, give them what they want to read. Right. And they're going to read, read constantly. Right. Um, and, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I read boys life magazine. Right. Yep. And it always had a little bit of fiction in there and a little bit of like, you know, how to, and, you know, I think it came through the boy scouts or whatever, something like that. And even though I wasn't a boy scout, I kept my <laughs> subscription of, of boys life anyway, cause I liked the magazine or whatever. And then I'd switch over to like, my Sergeant Rock comics, and uh, um, maybe then a little Ray Bradbury yeah. and uh, Martian Chronicles or something like that. And I would, and I would ha always have like a bag of Doritos and like Seven Up or or Sprite right. by my side, right. and just just a nightlight on, you know, like and and my dad used to say like, you know, and this is when I'm like sixth, seventh grade, maybe eighth grade. 
And he'd be like, like, why do you sneak off to bed like that? You know, like, why don't you just at least tell people you're going to bed or whatever? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, know, because yeah. I just like to sort of like slip on out, you know, out the back, Jack, make a new plane stand and, and head up and, and go into my new world, you know? And I'm still like that. I'm still very much like that. But, you know, my two sons, I think they have thousands of books of manga, right? Yeah. They're totally into that. Yep. And uh, in fact, to the extent that now they have like an online bookstore where they sell it, you know, like, you know, oh, sure. yeah. but, um, okay. it, so like, uh, and you know, they, they used to like, I remember my son Harrison was telling me like, he's like, Oh, I would, uh, I would sit in school and like, you know, like with the textbook out and have like a book of manga. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, good for you. Like the yeah. stuff they tell you, like years later, right? Right, right, right. Exactly. All, all the, all the secrets that they had going on. Now you're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and, I, and I, I laugh at them. Yeah, and that, but that, that's the whole case, right? I mean, so a little bit on my reading habits. I, embarrassing enough to say, didn't read for pleasure until I got to like college, till I was like eighteen or so. And the reason right. for that was because I remember English classes in high school. It was all, you know, I mean, we read like Edgar Allan Poe. We read, you know, uh, uh, The Monkey's Paw. We read the classic stories like that. But then right. most of the novels that we were reading were uh, of Mice and Men and John Steinbeck. Right. And, you know, I'm not trying to dish on the dead <laughs> or anything of that no. nature, but it was just, it, was, it wasn't something that was that was grabbing my attention. It wasn't right. compelling me to 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 read. Right. And most of my most of my uh, summer reading was mandatory. You know, this was these are the books you have. Right. These are the books you should read. And this, you know, you will do the assignments based on that. Right. It wasn't until I took a, it wasn't until I took a um, science fiction seminar year of college, that introduced me uh, to the power of uh, short fiction, like. You know, Mars is Heaven by Ray Bradbury. That story, right. like, did a number on me. That was my gateway drug into the power right. of short fiction. And then right. from Bradbury, I went on to, you know, Asimov. I went on to Harlan Ellison a couple of years recently. And then now I'm on Charles Beaumont and, you know, uh, uh, Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. So, you know, it's – this is – Back to what I was saying, like it's not that boys aren't interested in reading. It's that if you give them something of interest, if you give them something that's going to meet to, that's going to pique their interest. If you give them, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Robert E. Howard, or any of those other uh, classic adventure uh, writers, I guarantee you, you'll, 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 something will click in them for for them to say, oh, this is cool. I want more of this because that's how it was was for me. So primarily, what I do now, I write short stories. I have a. Uh, a collection here, yes, and other short stories that came out a couple uh, weeks ago, um, and that's just kind of been my main medium. Is because when you when you when you really read a good, powerful short story, something that's imaginative, something that you know uh, really captures your attention. Because short stories are just because they're shorter doesn't mean they're easier than say like longer form prose and all that other stuff, but you know, short stories. Do you mean easier to read or, or easier to write? Easier to write. I mean, I yeah. think I think a lot of you know, uh, I've I've always been bullish on short fiction. I think short fiction is you know, even though it's not, how shall I say it? It's you know, most people don't talk about the latest short fiction, the short story that they they read. They mostly talk about you know the latest novel or the latest comic or whatever TV show or whatever the case may be. But I think a lot of very true. Yeah, and I think a lot of what 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 I do now is is practicing short fiction. It's just it's a it's a wonderful form. It's a wonderful art form, yeah, um, sure. and I am branching out to novels. Hopefully, in between now and twenty twenty four, but you know, short stories are will always be my first love because that's what got me hooked on reading. On reading, right? Um, yeah, I have to like all too often. I will sit. I will sit down and set out to write a short story of say 5,000 words mm -hmm. and AKA, um, AKA IE, I should say, um, <laughs> wake up Vince. Um, the most recent, I just finished the moonlight. Moonlight is where I wrote it. Right. 
and I was like, I totally intended for that to be like five or 6,000 words and like, boom, 27,000 words later, it ballooned into a short novel, but it yep. needed to be, it just yep. needed to be, you know? Yep. And uh, I just had, I had no plan for it, but the muse wants you to do that. And that's, that's what happens. So if I'm going to write a piece of short fiction and stick to that, like say, say you contact me and you're like, Vince, I need a story. Mm -hmm. 6,000 words tops. Yep. Okay. I'll get it to you. Um, but I have to put myself in that mindset. Yes. Yes. And it's all, it's a different, it's a, it's a different, um, it's not a different genre, but it's, it's a different, different way it's, of, yeah, of looking at the story. It's a different skill set it entirely. Too. Different skill set. Because when you're doing, when you're doing a short story, I mean, I've had stories that I had one story that I wrote last year in less than two hours called Debt Troopers. And I realized uh, it was basically if uh, the U if the international banking system and U.S. Congress were in bed together and the banking system woke up one day and said, you know what, we're tired of uh, of uh, people not paying their student loan bills. So they basically organize a black ops unit of making up of uh, uh death row inmates, the worst of the worst, <laughs> That's and cool. a lot of other stuff. And they basically right. give them the assignment to procure the debtor, procure the debtor. I wrote that in less than two hours. Out after all the the hubbub of student loan stuff going on in the news. I wrote that. Right. And it's it it's it's a, it's only about twelve, fifteen hundred words, but it packs a punch. And a lot of people right. seem to to feel that sort of catharsis when you when you read you know at least some of the stories that i write there's a there's a certain uh uh tension of release that, that kind of goes on where people are just kind of right. you know they're it's a form of escape it's another form of escapism sure how often you're getting your 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 short fiction to market how often how often do you like sit sitting down to write something yeah and then coming I, up with a finished po product and getting it out to market yeah so i write so Grind took me a little bit longer because I was just learning publishing, right? I was just learning like cover design. I was just learning, you know, all that stuff. Right. I had Harvey Stambro, you know, another mutual right. artist, you know, do a lot of the, uh, paid him for a lot of the editing. Um, but I think for me now that I understand what the heck I'm doing, I could probably, I, I'm hopefully getting another collection out. Uh, it's called Numbing Glass and Other Strange Stories. I'm getting that out early November. So all in all, you know, I don't. I no longer send short stories to traditional magazines because I got my own. So I pretty much try right. to do it. You know, I probably probably try to do uh, two to three stories a week, releasing them. If they're not released in the magazine, they're released in another collection. Hopefully, it's coming November. So I try to. Right. I'm, my process is is not perfect by any means. It's still a little bit refined. I also have a uh, you know uh, a son who's going to be two in December. So that adds for a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah. I know the I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's taking up time, but I think I think my process is slowly being refined. That hopefully I can bang these out, you know, on a weekly basis and not have to, you know, uh, outsource a lot of the uh, publishing to anybody else. Now, speaking of this, what what's Frank Theodat's writing process like? What's your day like? Yeah. Yeah, so right now my day is I'm up with, uh, you know, my son gets ready for, for daycare. I'm in between jobs right now. So in terms of looking for uh, work, I used to be a stay-at-home dad. I was a stay-at-home dad for about 16 months. Uh, okay. My son recently started daycare, so he's starting daycare. So I'm back on the job hunt. But up until now, uh, I've been going to the library when my son gets dropped off from daycare. And I'll just work in the library, and I'll get one of those quiet study rooms pop them on my laptop and I'm like, all right, new document. I will have, sometimes I'll have a theme. So like my new collection is on nostalgia and the troubles with looking, the troubles with living in the past so often. So those are the stories that I'm coming up with. So I may have a theme in mind, but sometimes I'll just have, you know, as Harvey Stambro or as Dean Wesley Smith often says, start with a character in a setting with a problem and I'll just start off there. Right. If if it grabs me, sometimes it takes, you know, maybe a thousand words for me to really understand where I'm going because I don't really right. plan anything ahead. So once right. I'm in this kind of world I've constructed, 
hours could pass by and I don't even know, you know, it could be lunchtime and I'm like, oh crap, like I got a, <laughs> I got another right, appointment right. Something else of that nature. Right. Um, some stories come to me, you know, within a couple hours and I'll write it in, in that one sitting. Other stories, you know, I could meander on, I could be traveling here, I could be going with this character. And I don't even use the full uh, words that I produce. So I could write a story that's 3,000 words, but only use about, you know, 2,000 of them because everything else is just kind of exploring, you know. Right. Like it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't fit the story. It's, it fits me. It serves me as the writer. Right. So that's just kind of how I, how I've come to, come to do it. I mean, it's, it's every, every, every story is something different because these stories that I've written are more, they're twilight zone like stories. It's basically sure. no, seemingly normal, normal people going through strange and unusual circumstances. Right. And uh, that's, that's pretty much how it's been. I'm, 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 I'm being more character driven with each coming story. Um, right. So I think for me, it's just a matter of like carving out the time now that I have it, sitting down mm. and just kind of like exploring. Like I don't, I don't have a word count in mind. I know I want to write a short story, but I don't have a word count in mind. So some, so my last short story was about nineteen hundred words. My story before that was about almost four thousand words. So I know in my mind, I tell myself I want to write a short story, and I'll just come up with a random character or a random theme or a random setting, and I'll just explore that for a little bit, and then come a couple hundred, maybe a thousand words or two. I'm like, oh, I know where I'm going. I know how this ends, and then I'll just write to the ending, and then I'll just right. be done. That that's that's the way to do it. Go right through. It's yeah. funny you mentioned the Twilight Zone because I too am just such a major fan. Yep. And uh, I've even, and I'm sure you maybe you've done the same thing, but I've looked up all the plots of the Twilight Zone. I've seen them all. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, and I'm like, well, I'm gonna write my version. Yeah. Of of you know, the one with uh, the guy who played the Riddler on Batman, Burgess Meredith. Oh, Burgess Meredith, you know, yes, yes. Yeah, remember the, the librarian? You know, yeah. who, you know, he didn't like people. Perfect, not enough time. I think it's called Not Enough Time or something like that. Something like that, but it's the perfect ending, too. Perfect ending. It, absolutely perfect ending. And and I was, and it became, for me, it became the man the man who wished for the end of the world. Yeah. And uh, Or something like that. I forget what I called it. But uh and it went hand in hand with the beginning of the Ukraine war when all the mainstream media was like, um, be prepared for the Russians to lob nukes on your head any minute now, you know? And, uh, and I, I was like, well, I'm going to, I got, I, because in the whole world felt like it was like the 1950s and sixties again, and, you know, duck under your desk, you know, yeah. while the nuke just, you know, yeah, I mean, destroys you. My Twilight Zone is how I discovered my favorite short story writer, who is Charles Beaumont. And Charles Charlie Beaumont, Beaumont, yeah, yeah right. Charles I love Beaumont, that. And he, he, he had. I, I think if he were alive today, he'd probably be read in schools. I think I honestly think so because he was such a, such a unique talent and such a a, a mastery of short form. I think he wrote a couple novels, two or three novels. Um, one that was adapted uh, uh, into a film with William Shatner. Um, right. I can't remember the name of it, but I mean, his his work is just has such an impact on me that you know I wrote uh, an essay um, for P three uh, Cheers, gentlemen, in which it was honoring Ray Bradbury. Yes, I read that. Uh, Harlan Ellison, Charles Beaumont, and Rod Serling. I mean, these guys really made up my imagination. Like they they set up the foundation for everything. Because that's right. just how my mind works. My mind works in a more offbeat Twilight Zone esque world, where yes. normal people just go through weird and strange circumstances. And sometimes, you know, I know people always say that you, you know, you got to have a likable character, or you got to have someone to root for in the end. Some of my, some of my stories, uh, that, yeah, exactly, no, like no. exactly. <laughs> no, I've, I've never felt comfortable with that because some of my stories are 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 acting in more of like cautionary tales. Cautionary right. tales where terrible things can happen to terrible right. people, but also sometimes you just, you know, you, you just, you, these characters are the victims of dumb luck. I mean, I have a, I have a story in here about um, a, a workaholic analyst who loves his job, loves working, can't get enough of it, uh, works during the weekends, hardly takes a lunch, but he's getting older. He's in his, he's middle-aged, he's in his 50s, and he's got arthritis. 
and he's right. you know he's his office is changing. They've got new cubicles where you can actually see people. They've got you know younger younger uh, people in the workforce, and so he's getting the opportunity for a promotion. And his boss is asking him, well, since you're the senior member, we'd like your recommendation for someone to take the, the position. And so he challenges his boss and says, give me, give me the end of the, the quarter or anything else there. And I'll, I'll prove to you that, that my, uh, my, work is, my work is good. So he goes off to this dingy little medical facility, uh, smells terrible. Uh, the, the, the nurse just looks kooky. And he gets this operation done and he gets these uh titanium uh uh robotic like hands that help him work <laughs> faster awesome. and it does not end well for him and it doesn't end well for another character there but these these are these are just how the stories that i love to tell stories you know in in the tradition of the twilight zone it's one of my favorite shows of all time and i think it's one of the greatest tv shows of all time to, to boot I, I do too i think uh um i think rod serling is sorely missed yep um you know um just a massive effect on me you know like and you and all those stories the production even stands the test of time yep. you know um just uh, i i love them and uh, you know i was writing the meta man series for the longest time and then i sort of put it aside and got to some other novels and stuff like that but i will go back to them and i can't wait to read grind too and I like the cover you did for the second one that's about to come out. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've gotten I've gotten faster with my covers too. So Grind took me about ninety minutes. Uh, Adobe InDesign, Adobe Stock, and just learning the ins and outs. It's a very cumbersome uh, program. It's not. It's not. Uh, <laughs> I haven't found it easy to do. So it took me ninety minutes to do that cover. But the second cover for Numbing Glass is the next one, which Numbing Glass means <clears throat> is basically uh, what we've got here little phones and TV and the little glasses that we, that we use to kind of form of as a form of escapism. So that's kind of the right. play, play, uh, play on that. But yeah, the cover, that cover took me probably 25 minutes. So I'm getting, I'm getting faster with it, which is what I like. That's awesome. Big Philly says, hi, by the way, uh, P3 is great. No woke bullshit either. <laughs> um, thinks this is a great show. Um, Holiday Maggie, Magic, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can hardly see. P3 is definitely an important movement led by such talented writers. I loved your first book, Frank. We are excited for you to release num Numbing Glass. Thank you very much. You got some fans out there, buddy. Yeah. You well, got some serious fans. Yeah. Maybe you, should, maybe you shouldn't uh, go the traditional work route. <laughs> this is, <just>, this is <laughs> not professional financial <laughs> advice. This is for entertainment value only. Yeah, I'll let my wife answer that one. How about that? <laughs> let's see, yeah. let's see how she how she feels about me just kind of like being a, a professional <laughs> writer when we've got you know some, some yeah tonight over the over the pork chop and mashed potatoes or whatever. Just be like, right, I'm, right. I, I've been meaning to talk to you about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, hey, if if it's anything, if it's anything like Dean Koontz, you know how Dean Koontz got to 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 be where where he was. The, the no. deal that, so Dean Koontz read this you know a couple years back i think in the back of uh, uh, a paperback or something his uh he wanted to be a novelist and his wife said i'll make a deal with you i will give you five years for you to make it for you to be the writer for you to you know make a living at this and she's like i'll right. she's like i'll subsidize you and all that other stuff and he tried to finagle his way. He's like, oh, can you can we do seven years? And she's like, no, <laughs> five. And he's like, all right. And, 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 within, and within five, yeah, and within five years it became, you know, the Dean Koontz. Like just the Dean Koontz. Yeah, just pumping out novels, you know, like left and right. Right. Remember on uh, um Californication? Yes. When when, when Hank Hank was in, down on his luck yep. as usual, and yep. he had to, no choice but to find a teaching job. Yep. And and so like to go to the college professor or the college, the Dean's house. And they're like, what's your name again? And he's like, Dean. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, don't say it. Yeah. Dean Koontz. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. That's a total good writer. Yeah. Total yeah. writer humor, of course. Yeah, yeah no. I but mean, so he's an interesting character to be to begin with. All right, Frank or Frank, I've taken up much too much of your time already. This has been fantastic. Will you come back? Oh yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> I'm around, my friend. So, and I want to have, I want to have your partners too. And maybe next time we can bring uh, all three of you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, that I'll would be quite the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I've I've told them about you know uh, the work that you put out. I've told them about the YouTube channel. They're very interested. And like everyone, uh, everyone that I work with works at a professional professional level. I mean, Brady and and Frank Kidd, they're they're over. You know, I, mean, I think Frank Kidd's finished his third novel. So like they're <laughs> they're putting me to shame. They're cracking out. You know, uh, left yeah. and right themselves. But yeah, we, I I would love to do this again, man. This was this has been awesome. I love talking. Sounds about like it. all you guys are putting out a lot of work really fast. There really is a movement going on. Yeah. I could feel it. And there was this, this similar movement ten years ago, ten to fifteen years ago that I was a part of, and then they all sort of dispersed. Yep. Into their own, you know. And uh, now I can tell like there's another right. another movement, you know, like groundswell that's happening, yes. and and I, I like to be part of those things, you yeah. know, um, you know. I used to, during the first one I was their age. Now I'm like a little bit older, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and uh, I'm like the old dude, but uh, I don't yeah. care. You know, I, mean, I, I will I will say this: part of the plan for next year, for because we're already. Like you've said this before, we're already into 2024 in terms of planning and all other stuff. We are, we are. Yeah. I, one of the things that I really want to do is put out physical products. So we've talked sure. about like the the boys' fiction and all that stuff. I want to do those into physical, like hold in your hand books. That's what I want to oh, do. Oh yeah, you need to. Sure. But for but, yeah. for, but for P3, we're we're everyone's asking me if I want to do um, uh, if we're taking in submissions. And my thought process here is I want to take submissions, but I want to pay the writers a fair rate for each submission. Excellent. I don't want to do uh, freebies and all other stuff. But yeah. my plan for next year is to put out P3 anthologies. And I've thought Excellent. about inviting uh, some writers whose work I personally like and admire to contribute either a story or something of that nature, um, you know, whether biannual or however – you know, the hell for it. So, but All right. your name is, is, is top on that list, sir. So I'll definitely be in touch. Oh, I hope so. Thank, uh, I, I appreciate it, Frank. Listen, yeah. uh, and, and I would love to be a part of it. Um, and I'm honored. Where can people find you? They can find me on Substack mostly. I have two, well, I have one newsletter called The Pulp Fictioneer. You can find that on Substack. Um, the magazine, you can either go on Substack or you can go to Pulp Pipe poetry.com which will lead you to the substack um and i'm also the author of grind and other strange stories which is now on amazon barnes and noble kobo and soon to be on google books fantastic my friend frank it's been a pleasure That's and i hope to see you. and i know i will see you again soon and say hi to the guys for me will do and for everyone thank you everyone for chiming in um and for everyone else i will see you Tomorrow, if not tomorrow, then definitely Thursday with my agent, Chip McGregor. And ciao, ciao.